All right, Mary Beth, take it away. <laughs> Mary Beth, if you're talking, we can't hear you. <laughs> okay. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming today. Um, I uh, just want to talk a little bit about our collection at the Ceramics Research Center and uh, the reason why, besides the fact that Lucy Ree is one of the most important um, ceramic artists from the mid-century, we also have a very uh, robust collection of her work. We have about 24 objects uh, of her work between the 1950s and the 1980s. Uh, the donations were uh, from the, the uh, donations started in the 1980s and up until the uh, 2017. And uh, from different collectors, we have uh, works from her that range from bowls to vases to bottleneck vases and even a coffee pot. So what I would like to do is just give you a little uh, bio of Lucy Ree, and then I will introduce Jeffrey and we can uh, experience the objects in a different way that we could in a museum. He can um, hold them and show them up close, tell about his uh, personal stories, and then we'll circle around and I will have some images up of some of the selected objects from the collection that we can have a little conversation about and then Q&A. So let's get started. Um, so Lucy Ree grew up and studied in Vienna she was surrounded by the style and elegance of modernism. In 1937, she arrived in Britain as an Austrian refugee escaping the rise of Nazism. The ceramic scene in Britain, however, was very different. It was dominated by Bernard Leach, who uh, wrote that uh, very few people in this country think of making of pottery as an art. So during the Second World War, she began producing ceramic buttons for the fashion industry and uh, spotted that there was a gap in the market as many British button factories had been re-questioned uh, re um, for the war effort. So Lucy Ree had to uh, travel across Vienna on a tram to find the nearest kiln and so because she wanted to limit the transportation of these fragile pieces, she uh, started what is uh, called uh, raw glazed pots. So normally you would at least do two firings, one uh, with the raw clay to make it more durable, and then you would glaze, and then you would do a glaze fire. So with Lucy, she did it all in one shot. So one, one, uh, a w once firing is, is kind of what they call it. And she also invented an extraordinary range of glazes, which I will talk about later on when I select some of the objects from the collection. So, and this is her studio here. So I'd like to introduce Jeffrey now. Jeffrey Spahn is a specialist in ceramics and 20th century sculpture. With over 20 years experience in the field, he has worked with some of the most premier museums, universities, public and private collections in the world. The gallery focuses on 20th century American, British and Japanese studio ceramics and is uh, one of the largest inventories of consigned pottery and ceramic sculpture. So Jeffrey, thank you again. You know that you're a dear friend to the ASU Art Museum and the Ceramics Research Center. So thank you for joining us today. <clears throat> Great. Uh, Mary Beth, thanks so much. I really appreciate the invitation. Uh, mm -hmm. And Andrea, thank you very much also. I appreciate you coordinating all of this for everybody. Um, <clears throat> hopefully you can see everything here. Um, I know uh, it's difficult times and we're all doing this over Zoom, so I appreciate everybody's flexibility. Um, one of the things that I would encourage everybody to do right from the beginning, please, is um, my assistant is in my ear. Um, McKaylee is on the phone with me. So if you get a chance, 
um, use the chat room option. And if you have any questions while we're talking this afternoon, um, type your questions into the chat room, please. And McKaylee, since I'm gonna be walking back and forth, um, McKaylee is gonna do me the favor. Um, I won't be able to be right in front of the screen with you um, to read the questions, but she'll be able to tell me what you all are asking um, in my ear. And I'll do my best to respond to them. So <clears throat> we will use the technology to our greatest advantage. Um, by way of introduction, I used to be a professor here at UC Berkeley. So I am broadcasting here from my new home here in Berkeley. And um, I used to teach multicultural education, but as Mary Beth mentioned, I'm now a private art dealer. I specialize in 20th century sculpture, but my real passion is studio ceramics. And I've been obsessed, absolutely obsessed with Lucy Ree and um, one of her colleagues named Hans Koper, um, two British contemporary potters since I was about 14 years old when I first discovered their pots um, through imagery. And um, as Mary Beth mentioned, today I'm gonna try and awaken and aliven their pottery. Even though it's on Zoom, we're gonna try and make it a little bit more three-dimensional. Um, even in museums, when you're walking around and you're seeing these pieces, um, you don't always get an opportunity to turn them upside down and engage with them, hopefully the way that we will be able to engage with them today. So um, just to bring you back to a little bit more biographical information about Lucy Ree, um, I always like to kind of take us back, it's 2020, and I need us all to remember that Lucy Ree was making pots, you know, from the 1940s, basically, up until her passing. And that was essentially five decades or more. Um, you know, and that was a long time ago. And when she was first making pots, we have to remember and put ourselves back that it was not 2020. Um, I think that a couple of things to remember right off the bat. Um, there was a terrible world war happening. Um, Certainly women artists were not appreciated the way that hopefully we appreciate them as equals today. Um, and she was just an exceptional human being from the very beginning. Um, and I think it's really important to remember the context in which these pots were made because we cannot look at them today with a 2020 lens and understand them today without understanding the time in which they were made. I just think that's really important. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, I like to promote, and because of my background as a professor of multicultural education, I've always liked to promote women artists, artists of color, queer artists. Um, but Lucy Ree is an incredible and wonderful exception in many ways because, you know, Lucy Ree, uh, man, woman, child, it doesn't matter. Lucy Ree was always the leader of the pack. And I am so happy to say that um, 
you know, Lucy Lee has always been just an exceptional um, uh, person on the forefront of ceramic uh, leadership. And uh, I think we can start by looking at one of these pieces. And I think this, this is gonna show you really where I'm coming from. Um, actually, visually on Zoom, I'm gonna use a little fashion moment to help you see this. So as Mary Beth pointed out, um, the predominant pottery of the day, actually I'll hold it over here. The predominant pottery of the day was by um, one of her British counterparts named Bernard Leach. And Bernard Leach was um, really obsessed with Asian aesthetics, right? So Bernard Leach um, famously wrote, you know, um, Potter's book and everybody, you know, traveled with this sort of um, uh, Bible as it was of, you know, Potter's knowledge. Um, and if I can sort of make a Potter's joke, um, the predominant color of Bernard Leach's pottery, which I love and adore actually, um, but the predominant color of Bernard's pottery was brown, right? Earth tones, um, chocolates, oatmeals, beiges, um, honey colors. Um, and unfortunately, most of the examples here um, are black and white, but a lot of the examples at the Ceramics Research Center that Mary Beth will show you later on um, include vibrant colors. Um, Lucy Ree was known as a modernist. She was friends with um, contemporaries of her day who were fashion designers, who were interior designers, who were architects, who were other fine artists, sculptors, painters. They were not just other potters. Um, Lucy Ree was somebody who associated herself with other people that were esthetes, right? Um, and Lucy came from a background where her family um, was really a, a, an aristocratic family um, from Vienna. So one of the stories that I want to tell you about, and one of the things that I think is just really important to um, humanize Lucy, uh, her father was a doctor. She, um, you know, back in the 1940s during the war, she had the opportunity. Um, she came from a Jewish family and um, unfortunately, um, unlike, you know, some, you know, families, Lucy did have the opportunity to get a visa to go to England. And so she was able to flee. And during the war, um, she was able to go to London. And she established a new home and a new studio um, in Albion News. And she was able to escape uh, Nazi um, invaded Europe. Um, but as Mary Beth pointed out in her biography, what Lucy did, Lucy, I, I like to tell people that Lucy was sort of the Schindler's List of pottery uh, and ceramics. For those of you that have seen the movie Schindler's List or know about that experience, um, Lucy Ree was able to use her studio in London as a refugee um, employment opportunity where 
she had a contract with the famous fashion houses in Italy. Um, during World War II, uh, metal was quite precious. All the metals were, um, you know, reserved for the war effort. So metals were being used for shipbuilding and, you know, bullets and bombs and just a terrible time. And so if I show you an example on one of her books, um, I have a, a stack of books here. There have probably been 30, 40 books written on, on Lucy Ree. So on the cover of this book, I hope you can see it. I hope it's coming through. Um, okay, great. So on the cover here of this book, it's an example of a, a copper green bowl with the, a bronze glaze rim on this bowl and the form next to it is um, by the potter Hans Koper. Um, but that bronze luster metallic rim there, good you can really see it there, um, that drippy metallic glaze that she developed. Um, Lucy used that glaze to um, her advantage. And she was quite clever. And she created a series of ceramic buttons where she was able to uh, create molds and uh, through fairly low skilled labor, she was able to shepherd uh, refugees, Jewish immigrants um, from the war uh, over to London and to work in her studio. And they would press clay buttons, porcelain buttons um, into these molds. And then they would finish the edges, polish them, uh, turn out the holes in the buttons, and then she would have them glaze the buttons with the, that bronze glaze that was on the rim of that bowl. And they would mimic these fancy, precious buttons for these, um, you know, blazers and, um, fashion coats and sweaters and um you know to mimic these fancy metal buttons that could no longer be made during the war and she used that opportunity to save many many lives and i just think that it's so important to remember that lucy was not only an exceptional craftswoman and craftsperson, but that she was an exceptional human being. And I just admire her so much um, as a person, not only um, as a potter. And to, to tell you a little bit more about that experience, one of the people that she saved, and I really use that word purposely, was a young man who showed up on her doorstep named Hans Koper. Um, Hans Koper was probably her most famous student. Um, and not to be gauche, but uh, sometimes people like to know about values. And um, Hans Koper and Lucy Ree, often it's a horse race. They sort of jockey um, back and forth as to who is the most valuable studio potter. And today, um, the records are um, back and forth that, you know, their pots, a simple bowl by Lucy Ree or a vase by Hans Koper, um, have sold for half a million dollars. Um, and that's quite exceptional. Um, and it gives you a sense of just how important uh, Lucy 
was as a leader of this entire studio ceramics movement. Um, I just want to finish up the, the details of this pot before I show you one of her students' pots, Hans Koper. And, and the reason why I want to show you the details of this pot is because when I talk about value, um, sometimes people will react to that and think, gosh, you know, why should a pot be worth half a million dollars? I mean, that's just ridiculous. Well, I'm going to show you. The reason why is because details matter. And this is not a mistake. This pot is probably the earliest example. It's from the late 1940s. And if you look at all the books on Lucy Ree, you'll see um, similar examples. This happens to be one that I own. Um, and the leaf pattern on here is a leaf pattern that she derived from a Roman bathtub that she admired in the Victoria and Albert Museum. And you will see that she took the time after she potted this piece, which by the way, is beautifully potted. It is almost paper thin. Um, I hope that you can see just how beautifully thin this is made. And she not only took the time to make that incredibly beautiful detail, but then she took the stem and the two little lines go straight through the bottom of the pot until you can see her beautiful signature, which is unfortunately upside down. I guessed wrong. I'm going to turn it the right way. So she made this incredible stamp of her two initials, the L and the R. She took those two lines all the way through the opposite side up until you see the other stem. And it's just that incredible attention to detail. And then through to the mouth of the piece, you see two additional examples of that leaf pattern. So hard to see on camera, but I do think that you can see it and you get a sense of this piece a little bit better in person. So um, just an incredible amount of time spent on what really is a, a simple butt base. This is, not meant to be an extraordinary piece. This would have been something that she picked simple, um, you know, wildflowers and had on her, um, you know, dining table. So I had mentioned Hans Koper. Hans Koper was probably her um, most uh, prominent student. Um, Hans Koper, I'm not going to spend too much time on Hans Koper, but I do want to mention him. They're often mentioned together as a duo. Um, I uh, am really happy to show you this piece and the details of it. Um, So again, Hans Koper finished his pieces very similar to Lucy. So he picked up the um, same details with the stamp. Um, it's nice that he left sort of some of the scraping tool edges on there. Um, if you peer inside here, it's probably impossible to see on camera with the lighting, but there's a, a stem inside of there. Um, people often think it's a candlestick, but it's actually a stem for flowers to be held upright. Um, and somebody asked a question in the chat room, which I do encourage you to ask questions as I show some of these objects. Um, yes, the on this vase, the stem does continue all the way down into the very bottom of this vase. Um, 
the way she achieved that, by the way, is that she um, used a embroidery or a knitting tool. Um, and she often, this is a, a technique that's referred to as scraffito, um, an Italian term meaning to scratch. Um, so you're scratching through the glaze. So as you dip through, uh, dip the piece in the glaze or spray glaze on, uh, for those of you that are makers, you can then scratch some of the glaze off and then when it's fired, it will leave that mark where you removed some of that glaze. Um, in this case, uh, she often referred to some of her pieces where she would use a cross hatching technique where she would um, go back and forth uh, and she would almost create like a, a woven pattern. Um, she would refer to it as knitting. Um, and you can see behind me, I just wanted to point this out too. Um, I have a weaving here by another British artist named Peter Collingwood. Um, Peter Collingwood was a prominent weaver from the United Kingdom who uh, was also a colleague of Lucy Ree and Hans Kopers. Um, this weaving was actually in an exhibition um, at the Victorian Albert Museum in a uh, uh, combined exhibition that Hans Koper and Peter Collingwood had together at the at the V&A. Um, so I just want to check my notes here and make sure that I'm not missing any um, things that I wanted to go over today. Um, Okay, great. So Lucy Ree was somebody who, as I said, had a career that spanned actively five decades of making. And she became very, very well known. She was probably, um, I would say she was probably the most well-known, um, certainly the most well-known in the United Kingdom, um, but one of the most well-known in the world, um, even during her lifetime. And so the assumption that people often say that, you know, um, you know, famous people are never famous during their lifetime and have to die before they become famous. It's just not true. Um, she was very well-known during her lifetime. Um, and she was quite celebrated. Um, she was certainly more celebrated towards the, the end of her lifetime, um, but she was celebrated by her peers um, and her peers in the other art forms. So one of the people who started to celebrate her um, fairly early on was a Japanese fashion designer named Issei Miyake. And Issei Miyake was, um, uh, still is, uh, considered, um, you know, one of the most premier fashion designers in the world. And uh, started to collect Lucy's pieces because he was just so inspired by her ceramics. Um, inspired by her forms, inspired by her textures, inspired by her colors. Um, one of the things that inspired him very early on was a technique that Lucy used where she was able to twist both stoneware and porcelain clays together. So for all of you that know about throwing on the potter's wheel, um, you, of course, throw a ball of clay onto the potter's wheel. And as it turns around, it starts to twist. But if you simultaneously take a ball of stoneware clay, which of course is more brown or full of iron content, and then you take a ball of porcelain clay, which is more kaolin-based or 
white, you know, in color. And you put the two together. And as the two start to twist and turn, they will start to spiral and start to mix on the potter's wheel. And so I wanted to show you this piece because it really is quite extraordinary. Um, when you see it just in an image, um, maybe that's better. I don't know if that's helpful. Um, it seems like it could be round, but if I turn it this way, you will in fact see that it has square edges. And what she has done here is quite magical. She has taken both stoneware clays and porcelain clays. I will turn it this way so that you can see at the top. You can really see what's called marbling here. So you can see where the porcelain and the stoneware clays have really mixed together. And the predominant white that you're really seeing where her mark is, that is glaze, right? But the lighter color here and the darker color right here is the mixture of the porcelainous clay and the more stoneware clay. And what's magical and what really inspired Ise Miyake is that as the clays were twisting and spiraling and as she was pulling them up on the potter's wheel, they would mix and twist almost like in a hurricane pattern, right? Like a cyclone. And then it's hard to believe this, but I'm just gonna have to take my word for it. There's only one glaze on this pot. It looks like, sorry, give the camera a minute to catch up. It looks like there might be multiple colors, at least a brown and a white, maybe even a pink and a gray. If you look really closely, maybe even a green or a blue or a mauve. But what's really happening here is this matte white glaze is reacting to the different minerals in the clay bodies themselves. So where the porcelain is more pure white, the glaze and the clay stay more white on the outside. And then where the clay and the glaze are more mixing with the mineral contents of the stoneware, you're getting more of those reactions. And then also what Lucy was really brilliant at quite early on was exploiting the volcanic nature of glaze where glaze sometimes is quote unquote immature or stays in its more gaseous state, bubbles and leaves these textures. These were some of the things that really inspired Mr. Miyake. I also think it's really quite extraordinary that she chose to leave this pot square on its base and then circular on its top. Um, this pot too, I wish you all were here and you could really feel this pot, but this pot weighs about, oh my gosh, I mean, it's hard just to keep holding on to it. Um, this pot weighs probably, I would say a good 15 pounds. Um, it's solid, thick through here. The walls are very, very thick through here. Um, maybe 10, 12 pounds. Um, 
but she did that on purpose because it really adds to the function of the piece. Um, she was thinking about that uh, the entire time she was designing it. Um, this piece is really meant to hold um, large stems, maybe stems that have apple branches or large flower heads on them. And that way the vase is not going to fall over. And um, she was really designing um, as she was potting. So it's not true that every pot needs to be paper thin. It depends on what the function of the pot is. So um, I think that she was absolutely brilliant. When you really get to hold these pieces and you get to live with them and you get to use them, you really understand how incredibly functional and not just beautiful, but functional and beautiful her pieces were. Um, so I'm going to point out, I'm going to point out two other pieces. Um, obviously, this is the largest piece that I have here. Um, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about more and tie into the, the biography that Mary Beth mentioned um, with this piece. And then I'm going to end um, with a story about the last piece that I have set out today. Um, but um, one of the things to remember about these pieces and about Lucy is that Lucy, I'm giggling because Lucy was only about five feet tall. So she was tiny. She was very, very tiny. And she was using a kick wheel. So uh, if you don't know what a kick wheel is, it has no electricity, there's no power. Um, she was doing it entirely by kicking her foot um, and using her hands. Um, and so many, many of her pieces were made um, in sections or segments. So if you look at her pots, um, people will say that her pots are uh, wobbly or a little bit off center or a little bit um, uh, not perfect, right? And um, Lucy has one of the best quotes of all time, and I hope that I can remember it on the spot. But a collector came into her studio and asked her about one of her pieces that was not perfect and didn't quite understand. And I, I do want to point out that this was an American collector. Um, and uh, said, you know, well, why are you selling anything that's not perfect? Um, and Lucy quite properly and politely said, perfection is not the goal. Excellence will do. And I just love that quote. I just think it is so great. I, I specialize in American, British, and Japanese studio ceramics. And having taught intercultural communication, it just thrills me to share that story because it points out uh, how, what a polite zinger that really was. Um, and this pot is a great example of that. So it's not perfect. It's not straight up and down. It's a little bit wonky. It's got a little twist to it. Um, but it's not because she wasn't trying for that perfection. It's really a factor of how it was made. So if you look really closely, I'm gonna try and do this on camera. Can you all see right about here? I don't know if that's coming across. Maybe McKaylee can tell me. So right about here, there's a line. 
And what I'm trying to point out to you is that this pot was obviously made in sections, right? And the reason why it was made in sections is because Lucy could not possibly have made that pot in one big throw on the potter's wheel. It simply would have been too difficult for her to kick that amount of clay and to throw that amount of weight. Um, so what she actually did there is she threw a vase or a cylinder and then she threw a bowl separately and she connected the two later when they were both stiffened up and then she went back at the last effort and then carved them um, together after she had seg sectioned them um, together and then she added that twist and um, uh, elongated all of those carved sections in, in that twisted form. And I just think that that's um, exceptional. Um, so I want to end talking a little bit about the, the last piece that I have here. Um, it's probably one of the more humble pieces that I have here. And um, I know, uh, I hope I haven't been too long winded. Um, but I know that Mary Beth coming up is going to show you um, quite a few wonderful, <clears throat> excuse me, wonderful examples from the Ceramics Research Center's collection <clears throat> at Arizona State University um, Art Museum's collection that include color and other beautiful glazes. Um, I know they have, you know, almost two dozen pieces to share with you. Um, but I wanted to share this piece as the last piece with you because it, it might be one of the most humble pieces, but it's just a beautiful story to share with you. So this is an espresso cup or a teacup um, and, and saucer. And it's from uh, what Lucy, you know, would have called her standard wear line. Um, if you look very closely at the rim of the cup, is a tiny little black edge um, as well at the rim of the plate. There's a tiny edge of black glaze that it's nice when it gets a little thicker and it starts to drizzle. Um, the saucer, of course, is very thoughtfully stamped with the mark, as is the beautiful cup. Um, and this cup uh, belonged to another exceptional woman, a uh, ceramicist named M.C. Richards. And those initials stand for Mary Caroline Richards. Uh, many of you know that name already if you're in the ceramics world. Um, Mary Caroline Richards wrote a famous book called Centering, um, but she was also known because she was a professor at the famous um, art school no known as Black Mountain College in North Carolina. And she was, it was her life's, one of her life's bucket lists, let's call it that, to meet Lucy Reed. And, you know, MC, I, I represent the MC Richards estate now. Um, my, my gallery represents the MC Richards estate. And um, so it was her life's goal to meet Lucy Ree. Lucy Ree was so famous and so prominent um, in the ceramics world. So later in life, she had an opportunity after she was at Black Mountain College uh, to travel to London. And she made an appointment 
And Lucy, by the way, was famous for hosting people. And she would host them. She was a great baker. And she would often have them for tea and crumpets or tea and biscuits or tea and cookies. And so MC wanted to go there and she wanted to buy a piece. But she got there and Lucy Ree's pieces were already very, very expensive. So they spent a wonderful time together. And <clears throat> at the end of the visit, she wanted to buy a piece, but she really couldn't afford it. And Lucy, I think, picked up on this. And so she gifted this cup and saucer to MC. And it was just such a lovely gesture. And I think that it says that, to me, it says that Lucy was an incredibly generous woman. She knew that she was the leader of the pack. She um, knew that MC Richards was also quite famous and prominent in both writing and in ceramics. And to give her this gift, MC kept this cup and saucer for the rest of her life. Um, she even wrote a poem about it. Um, and I will uh, send it to Mary Beth after this presentation. And we will post a copy of the poem um, on our social media, and then you all can read that after this presentation. Um, but I just wanted to end on that note and tell you just a little bit more about not only was she an incredible potter, but I think more importantly, Lucy Ree was an incredible human being. She was generous and kind. Um, she lived an incredible life. Um, and I think today she's still uh, considered the most important studio potter leading the movement among all of us today. So I'll turn it back over to Mary Beth. Thank you, Jeffrey. So I'm going to share my screen and um, Jeffrey, if you want to chime in, if you have anything to say when I show some examples. Feel free. Let me see here. So, as I mentioned before, uh, we have about 24 pieces of uh, Lucy's work. And um, a couple of years ago, a, a woman contacted us uh, because she wanted to make sure that she was able to get into the CRC. It was a day that we were closed to the public. And she happened to be in Arizona with her daughter and her granddaughter because she was graduating from ASU. And uh, when I met them, it turned out that she was Lucy Ree's great niece. And almost all of the objects that we have um, of Lucy Ree are out in open storage. And she was absolutely just amazed um, at how much work we had and how much was actually out in the open for the public to see. So that was a really great um, um, memory that I have of uh, just sharing what we have with the public. Um, so now we are open to the public uh, Wednesdays through Saturdays from 11 to 5. And if you're in the area, uh, please do uh, stop by. We are um, taking people from uh, uh, we're doing time entry. So Kat, can you actually um, put that in the chat so if people are in the area, they can um, sign in? Yeah, for sure. And then Mary, my... if you'll just click present on your screen. All right, hold on a second. Is that better? Did you click present? I did. Um, can you go over to view? Present. Okay, well, um, it's a little right. bit funky, but we can still see where you're, you're presenting, so it's okay. Okay, sorry about that. No, no worries. So I selected a few um, objects, and um, as Jeffrey mentioned, we do have 
some of her works that have vibrant glazes that she uh, invented. And the one on the left is the yellow bowl. And that was actually a glaze that used uh, uranium. And so eventually she had to stop using that because people thought it was dangerous. And um, so uh, that no longer is um, used in glazes. And these are also examples of uh, Jeffrey talking about the uh, metallic glaze that she would just paint around the rims and then it would just uh, start dripping down. Uh, these are some of her vases, and um, right here is the uh, scraffito that he was talking about, the technique that you can use to um, carve away at uh, the glaze. Uh, the lava volcano ash uh, looking uh, glaze on the right, which he was talking about earlier as well. So I wanted to point out that, um, and he had mentioned this as well, as you can see, um, the, the one on the right, uh, that uh, they're, they're uneven, they're not level. And she knew exactly how much that she could actually pull um, and how thin it could get before it actually collapse. And she wasn't concerned whether or not a pot was running true to its um, engineering sense. Uh, she, uh, like the unevenness and so that's why you can see on some of the pieces how there's just a slight angle. And then this is another uh, shape of vase uh, with uh, the glaze that he was talking about before and a really great piece. It's a, a coffee pot. Not sure what's going on with these red lines, but um, and then more scurfito as you can see on the inside. So um, I also wanted to point out that one of her signatures is actually the foot on the bottom. Um, it was important that uh, the base of the pot was well finished as well as the top for her, and she would also um, sometimes include a detailed scurfito designs inside the foot of the pots, and uh, her decorated foot rings became the signature mark and uh, as you can see in, in most of her bowls here. Mary Beth, I'm not sure if it's tracking. I'm just seeing slide number eight. Really? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure what else I can do. That's too bad. Um, what we can do is we can have this presentation for everyone who's watching. Um, we will also record Mary Beth's Does that PowerPoint. Work? Mm -mm. Hmm. But okay. we'll also record Mary Beth's uh, PowerPoint and maybe she can get can give a bit more information about these slides and we'll post that on our YouTube as well. So I can we'll have do that. a two-parter. That's too bad. Um, so is it still on eight? Mm-hmm. All right. Okay, well, I was gonna end with a really funny image and it's an image of Hans Koper holding Lucy Rees' legs outside of a top loading kiln. Um, as Jeffrey mentioned, she was very tiny. So um, her body was like halfway in to unload the kiln. So, but uh, we can look at these, um, like Kat said, I can uh, put the presentation online with some information about all the pieces that I was talking about, so. Great, do we wanna open it up? We have five minutes. Does anybody have any burning questions? Um, I will encourage you all to turn your videos on. I'm saying that as mine's off, but feel free to turn your video on and you have five minutes to ask questions to some of our um, experts. I think the slides came back on now. Are they, can you see them? Yep. Should I just quick run through them again? So yeah, can, for sure. Okay, so the bowls that I was talking about, the yellow glaze. Um, the vases that we have with the scraffito. And then this is where I was talking, the one on the right, you can really see how uneven the top is. 
and then the coffee pot that's on the right. And then more bowls and the foot that I was talking about, her signature. More scraffito. And then this is the picture of Hans Koper holding her legs while she's in the kiln trying to unload, so. Mary Beth, can you go back to slide 13? Uh-huh. So obviously somebody interject if there's a question, but so slide 13 is just a perfect example of a bowl or a pot that could never have existed in the Bernard Leach world, right? Like this bowl is so modernist, so far afield from the sort of Bernard Leach traditions. It's, it's much more grounded in her um, aesthetic eye and her sensibility in you know, her upbringing in Vienna, her friendships and associations with architects and interior designers and painters. And um, I, I just, I see this bowl and I think even the sense of color, I mean, the way she's mixing color and texture and metallics with mats and, um, you know, it, it just blows my mind. It, it, even today, I look at that bowl, it looks so modern, so fresh, so cool. Like, it's just fantastic. I love it. And I want it. It's so great. Um, and the little bit of advice that sometimes, sometimes people ask me, which I have no place, but, um, the little bit of advice that I could give young potters or any potters making clay today is if you want to stand out, you have to make something different. And you cannot be following the herd. You, you have to follow your own voice. And I think for Lucy, if you read her own writing, if you read interviews, or if you know what she struggled with, she really struggled with acknowledgments of her own aesthetic. You know, was it good enough? Was it important? Did she have something to contribute? And I think she struggled with that because her work looked so radically different. Um, we look at this today, and I think, of course, we think this is pretty tame, right? Like, this is not, you know, shocking. Um, but when it was first made, I mean, this just, like, blew the doors off of people. And so if you're making something today and people kind of say, like, what? Like, you know, that's good. Like, keep doing that. Keep exploring that. Keep going down that path. Because... Um, it might not be, but it, it also might be that you're pursuing your own voice and maybe you're just going to stand out from everybody else. And I know that that's one of the qualities it takes. It's not everything. Just being different is not enough, but it is definitely one of the things that's required for being important in the future. All right. Well, with that, it is 101. I want to thank everybody for being here. Jeffrey, thank you for sharing your space, your time, your knowledge with us. It was really great. Mary Beth, same to you. Thank you so much. Um, everybody else, thank you for spending your lunch time with us. If you're on the East Coast, thanks for sharing your, you know, midday afternoon, late afternoon snack time with us. We will see you all on November 17th with Julio Cesar Morales, and he will be discussing George Gross. Uh, thank you, everybody, and stay happy, stay healthy, and keep on loving art. Thank you, Kat. Thanks, Jeffrey.
Thank you. Thanks, everyone.